Welcome to Song Sessions. I'm your host, David Pomeranz, and today we have one of the most talented and prolific musicians and songwriters of our time. He's had four successful careers, any one of which would have satisfied the dream of any mere mortal. He scored feature films like The Conversation and All the President's Men, Saturday Night Fever. He's won an Oscar for Best Song for the inspiring film Norma Ray. He's won two Grammys. He's a multiple Emmy nominee. He's written top 10 hit songs like With You I'm Born Again, one of my favorite songs. And along with his brilliant collaborator, lyricist Richard Malpy Jr., is one of the foremost theater composers on Broadway. I also hear he's a great bowler and makes a killer salad. <laughs> he does everything. All, all of that, yeah. All Ladies and that. gentlemen, it's my great joy to present to you my friend, the wonderful David Shire. Hi, Dave. Hi, nice to be here, David. Thank you very, very much. Uh, so glad we get to do this. Um, your, uh, your career sort of defies category, as I just sort of described in a small way here. So there you are uh, with this, uh, I keep using the word tool belt. When I talk to young writers and such, you know, you yeah. say you want to get stuff into your tool belt. You want to listen and listen and study. Yeah. Not study in a book, but study like well, what's he doing there, and you, you, you know the that yeah. kind of, the computing thing that's natural. Yeah, and that's kind of going on all my life, as I'm sure it has with. with yeah, you. of course, a fascination, right? I mean, uh, yeah, even on, on the radio, like if I hear something on the radio, even a contemporary, you know, a rock record or something, a pop record, you know, I'm going, what what's he doing there? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, and I'm sure you're the same way. Yeah. And uh, I'm st especially when I started doing film scores. That's what I wanted to ask you. Please, go ahead. A involve a more, uh, uh, I don't know how to describe it, a more knowing, a, a, I don't want to say higher form of composition because I don't consider writing musicals a lower form of composition, but it requires more technical musical skills. Mm, I understand. Yes, yes. And, and I've studied scores all my life uh, and and gotten the written music of, you know, songbooks of other songwriters. I got Billy Joel and the Beatles and everything. I got right, this is my studio, and I've got sure. shelves full of, full of books that right. you had to get before the internet. Now you can get everything immediately everything. Uh, right where I'm sitting. You know. yeah. But I've always been wanted to take a look at the engines of other people's cars and figure out what was wow. going on. What a great way to say it. <laughs> look in the engines of their cars. What I never said I never said that before. It's it just great. popped out. So what film composers knocked you out? Growing up, studying or just ever? Uh take a step back. It's the classical composers and who were inspired film composers mm. and those composers like Korngold, Dimitri Chiamkin, uh, uh, Alvin Ste uh, Steiner. Well, Max Steiner, sure, yeah. Max Steiner, uh, all those guys. Um, but by the time I was writing uh, theater scores, that golden age had passed and, you know, it was people like Lalo Schifrin Right. And uh, Dave Grusin and uh, uh, Quincy Jones, yep. uh, who had come in and, and scored. As movies changed, score uh, as the aesthetic of movies changed, the aesthetic of scores changed along with them. As movies became grittier, uh, scores became you know more jazz inflected and sure. all out jazz scores. Sure, and 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 he. Had, John Williams is is a corn gold on steroids. I don't mean that as a, as a, a criticism. I mean it's just he was Spielberg wanted told him he wanted those that type of score. Right. And and John, who's who I adore and who has incredible technique. 
I mean orchestral technique and compositional technique, right. was the perfect man to do that. Right. But he got his start. He was the he was the pianist for Henry jazz pianist for Henry Mancini at one point. Wow. He started out in jazz. Crazy, crazy, crazy. You know? Well, you know, you but you've got the chops in all of these mediums, and it's kind of natural for you. You've got you've got a pop sensibility, you've got a jazz sensibility, you've got and you've got the the heart and soul of of these these European classical composers that, yeah. that came into film. Um, and, and you know, I look at uh, work from you like, um, oh gosh, uh, uh, Return to Oz, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got this lush romantic passionate yeah. thing and uh you know and and it's goosebumps listening to it on its own it's it's as, it's as big and wide and as any as corn gold or any of those guys yeah. and then you did do you uh you know taking of pelham one two three and and it's something completely else yeah. and and yeah. it's it's extraordinary so i mean so again and the, con the conversation tool belt my friend what the conversation is like the whole other end of the scale a single piano Whereas Return to Oz, I finally got a chance to write a big symphonic score. Mm. I'd been waiting for that for oh, a that very, right? very okay. long time. Uh, and finally had a chance to do that. And I'm very, very proud of that score. Oh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a masterwork. It's absolutely gorgeous. But uh, again, and Pe uh, Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3 was on last night, by the way. Oh, what, the... Yeah. The original, the original one. The original. The original. Yeah. One you did. Yeah. And uh, listening to it while I was, you know, kind of working uh, upstairs, and my wife was listening to it. I went, "Wait a minute! I know that. I know that piece." Anyway, so I'm going to tell our folks uh, just a little, a little uh, um, quick recap of some of the movies you've scored. Do you know that, according to Wikipedia or one of those pedias somewhere, <laughs> that you've written 157 movie and TV shows? Scores? Did I, you know that? Really? Well, that's. <laughs> yes, I, you did. I, I never counted them exactly. I always say between 100 and 200. Well, yeah, 157. And it was all in one week, which is remarkable. <laughs> How did you do that? Actually, I've always considered myself a rather slow composer compared to some people, like, uh, say, Michelle Legrand, who was famous once for writing a score for a picture, an LA film, while. He was orchestrating it on the plane while he was going huh. cross country to do that. You know, they had had that European training of solfege and uh, perfect pitch where you can, uh, you know, I need to do everything at the piano. I see. Uh, what is the word you just used? Solfege. What does that mean? Uh, that's sight singing. You know, do re mi fa so, so la ti do, where you learn to sing a melody attached to syllables, and then you can trans transpose it and it's a way of hear uh, another tool to hear music in your head I and, see. and to s sight sing it. I see, yeah. I see. So when you, uh, th that's extraordinary. When, when you um, write uh, a score like, well, let's say the conversation, which is, as you say, is a little bit on it, on, on the side. It's, it's, tw it's, tur it's tilted in intentionally. Well, it, no, it, it, the movie, the nature of the movie determines the nature of the score. Mm. So uh, the the process of getting to the conversation music was a totally different one than from Pelham. I mean, if you want me to go into detail, I can go into detail because every, every film is ad hoc in, in terms of... Uh, the tools you use, the relationship with the director, uh, the nature of the subject matter. Uh, uh, so, so it's it's hard to say that you, it's what you said. You need a lot of tools in your toolkit to be able to cover that ground. Mm -hmm. For the conversation, you know, Francis was Coppola was my brother-in-law at the time, and uh, I I was visiting him with my first wife, his sister, uh, during the period when he was writing it. Uh, so I knew about the project way before he ever asked me to, to work on it. Uh, and when he finally did, it was even before the movie was being shot. Most films you get 
you see in rough cut uh, or fine cut, but you're, it's after the movie is shot. So you're seeing a v version of what the film is going to be. Right. Sometimes you get a script ahead of time. Mm -hmm. But with Francis, so I got the script ahead of time, but I was even on the set while he was sh shooting some of it. Wow. And when I came, when he, we first sat down to talk about the score, um, what he wanted, I thought, oh my God, I've been doing all these television movies with low budget scores and with television music, which tends to be very uh, uh, directly related to what's going on the screen. In other words, if there's a love scene, you write love music. If there's a chase, you write chase music. If there's a mystery, you write mystery music. And Francis knew that I that was what my most of my experience had been up to that point. And he, I, I went in thinking I'm going to get a big orchestra now. It's a big Paramount picture with a name director and Gene Hackman and all of that. And the first thing he said to me was. I don't want an electronic score. I don't want a symphonic score. I want a solo piano score. Mm, wow. And my heart sank. <laughs> and, um, and he told me the reason why. He said, you know, uh, I want the score to talk about, to relate to something that I'm not showing on the screen. He said, I know what I want on the screen, but there's a whole sub emotional subtext uh, that I want the score to deal with. I want to know what, more specifically, what's going on inside Harry Call, um, rather than, than uh, you know, looking at him from the outside. Right. So he, he gave me an exercise to do, which was, I'm going to give you, he said, I'm going to give you five titles uh, of of scenes, none of which are in the movie, but uh, I want you to go back to L.A. We were in San Francisco and, and write a three minute piano piece about each of these things and he, each of these uh, scenes. And he gave, gave me, I I wish I'd kept the list. I, I had the list and I lost it somewhere. I usually keep save everything that's involved with it. With it a score, uh, but it was Harry Call visits his grandmother. Harry Call picks up his laundry. Hmm. Harry Call uh, goes to his class reunion. Uh, and I thought he was nuts. But then my next thought was, he's Francis Coppola. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he can't be nuts. So I dutifully went back. I wrote the five piano pieces. You know, I composed largely improvisationally. I th the left brain tells gets me in the right place, but the, the fingers kind of do the walking to a certain extent. Right. Um, so uh, he listened to the first one and said, that's, that's uh, nice. P played it in the second one. He said, that's nice. I played him the third one. He said, that's the theme for, for the conversation. I want you to perfect that and, and uh, develop it you know, do all the things you do to wow. take a theme and make make a score out of it. Wow! And um, it 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 worked, and it was largely right brain seeded by his exercise, largely out of thinking about the movie in San Francisco and Harry Call. After the fact, I could I could figure out where. Uh, the influences came from that had been, you know, soaked up by me. Mm -hmm. I studied a lot of Chopin nocturnes uh, while I was taking piano lessons. And the right hand, which was uh, uh, about Harry's internal life, uh, you know, he played jazz sax, bad jazz saxophone to yeah. jazz records okay. back in his apartment at night. Yeah. Um, the right hand is... Is straight blues. You put them together and you get it. 
And the effect, I realized afterwards the left hand is Harry, what Harry reveals to the world. Mm. An ice cold technician, right. classical, uh, very organized. And the right hand is this kind of jazz side that he doesn't mm -hmm. show to anybody else. And that jazz part came, I'm sure, from when I was a freshman uh, at college. I would, when I was up late at night doing homework, I, writing a paper or something, mm -hmm. there was this jazz station. But if I hadn't had studied these particular things or heard those things, right. that theme wouldn't come out. Right. And, and then, as I say, the Germanic instinct put the two together to, to have both sides of Harry Call. Right. With Pelham, totally different process. Got the, the uh, assignment and uh, talked very little to the director uh, who uh, said, you know, I it's, it's, a, it's a heist movie and I uh, want a nice, tough heist score. Uh, and then went off to, I think, do preparation on some other movie because he that one he had finished except for the score. So uh, the first time I saw it, it was a movie. And I knew that uh, I wanted to write, I knew it had to be jazz because it was New York in the 70s, but New York also had rock and had ethnic music. Uh, it, it was a whole chaotic mess if you looked at it one way of a musical montage uh and also new york to maybe a tourist would seem quite chaotic you know how does this all hang yeah. together but underneath is the rectilinear streets uh the avenues and things so it's a perfect geometric grid mm -hmm. holding this holding this all together so i knew there was those two elements and I improvised and, and tortured myself at the piano for about a, a month hmm. to get the main theme. But everything I wrote was coming out uh, uh, bad Lalo Schifrin. <laughs> not, 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 not imitative of any bad music that Lalo Schifrin ever no, wrote. Know, he only, only wrote good music. Right. But bad imitation of of uh, you know trite all the things you'd expect from a jazz score and not as good as Lalo did it. Mm -hmm. So I was literally almost ready to give up the assignment. Oh my! Um, when one night I remembered that one of the uh, uh, classical teachers, uh, he wasn't exactly a teacher; he was a composer who was also a uh, mainly a classical composer, mod modern classical music. But he also was an ex-trombone player and loved, loved jazz. And we were having a conversation. He had informal, you know, uh, uh, bull sessions about music and it got into technical stuff. Mm -hmm. one, of those, one of those was uh, I was complaining about... Uh, you know, writing dissonant music. I said, you know, I really am, am totally turned off by Schoenberg and atonal music and, and uh, uh, the kind of music that makes people not want to go to concerts. And uh, he said, well, you know, uh, serial music doesn't have to be atonal. So that opened up a whole new world to me. Late one night, not smoking anything, because when I used to try to smoke something to to break break open something, uh, I would get uh, tired, hungry, and, <laughs> and and horny, and, and have no desire to write any music. I thought, why should I write music when I feel so great? <laughs> so I. I, yeah. I quickly learned not to turn to that as, right. a, as, a, as a crutch. Yep. But I remembered Paul telling me uh, that, that lesson I had with him, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if I, I wanted to control the, the jazz dissonance, I said, if I write, create a tone road that has only jazz intervals in it, 
major thirds, minor thirds, major sevenths, minor sevenths. Uh, essentially, the, the intervals you find in a blues scale, you know, and, and create that tone roll. Anything I did with it improvisationally, if I held myself to that, uh, would maybe get the sound I wanted. That was using technique, which seeded what I came up with in a whole different way mm. from the conversation. So by comparing those two things, you see how you, and there's every grade in between. Right. right. You know, when you, you're doing an ethnic score, uh, I do a lot of research. It's very easy now, and you can find anything. I used to have to go to dusty volumes in music libraries to look up what, what was the uh, Japanese uh, pentatonic scale. Uh, it's now right there. Uh, Articles all over, and on YouTube. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, even, did you know that even the sap of life is on YouTube? Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, everything's up there. Did you know do you know the boys at Google have, have a mission statement that within 30 years, they, I mean, this is a little silly, but they want to have all of knowledge yeah. on Google. Yeah. Everything known to man and beyond. Yeah. But you, okay. But you, <laughs> but there you, go. you see, they'll never have all of knowledge because you're always getting more knowledge. Thank you. That's correct. And when they get all that knowledge, it, it by say, oh my God, this leads to this knowledge, which we never knew till we put these two things together. That's very right. What I get from you is the, is a sense of adventure when I listen to your scores. It's adventure that seems to tie them all together. And I'm imagining that you're having, aside from the suffering part, where what the hell, ah, blah, blah, of, aside from that, that, but when you get it, this must be a thrilling experience for you when you're actually you know, listening back over the, listening to the playback or whatever it is, and, it, yeah. and it's working against the picture. A dirty, dark secret is that when I was first starting to do television scores at Universal, it's like the first thing you start, they start you on are, are uh, the Westerns and doing music for somebody else's series that mm. is, I, I, I did uh, the sixth, year, sixth season of The Virginian, huh. and I was writing a lot of cowboy music but uh -huh. we'd spot the the movie this the uh segment the episode yeah and you immediately go in and tell the music uh one of the music executives who hires the orchestras what kind of an orchestra you were going to need mm -hmm. uh, but it could only go up to 20 25 right because it's players. tv and then You'd go home, you'd see the movie, you'd go home, and you'd know that there's a A1 uh, studio orchestra that's going to be sitting in that in some studio there mm -hmm. uh, in two weeks, and you see a blank page in front of you, mm -hmm. and you say, oh, my God, I got 30 minutes of music that has to be on those stands in two weeks. Right. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, I had many, many, many mornings in that period where I would dry heave with stage fright before I could go to the piano and start working. I understand. Because I was so scared that it wouldn't come. It wouldn't be there. And, and the more technique I got, the more ways like we've been describing of going at scores the less I started dry heaving until it right. stopped completely. So, okay, I'm going to read a short list of some of your uh, some of your film scores for the benefit of our listener viewers. So we've got uh, The Conversation, The Taking of Pelham 123, The Hindenburg, that's a beautiful theme that you wrote, uh, Farewell, My Lovely, with Robert Mitchum, All the President's Men, that's a great movie. <laughs> that's so great. And I read an interview with you. Uh, so I don't know where you did it, but you, you mentioned that, that the theme, that there was very little thematic music until the end. Is that true? Yeah. And it was mostly just effects and, and uh, cause that's what, that's yeah. what it was called for there, right? Well, you talk about all the president of men. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that was kind of, I call them brain surgery scores. 
uh, as opposed to say if you're doing a Western, it's like taking out an appendix. But these scores, which I've been typecast as to a certain extent, which has kind of hurt me, or it's prevented me from say getting a reputation for writing big orchestral scores. Mm. They tend to typecast you in in Hollywood, you know. Sure. This one does that. This Hans Zimmer does Hans Zimmer scores and right. John Williams says John David Shirey's conversation like scores, which is not true because nope. any of us can write in all those different styles to make a living yep. uh, uh, as film composers. That's right. When I was offered that movie, Alan Pakula, I, I saw the movie and I said, Alan. What, what can music do for this film? It's fabulous, and it, it's it's semi-documentary, yeah. and it's uh, uh, I, I think music can only uh, cheapen it or make it seem like it's trying to be something else. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, he said, I want music to do this. One specific thing, I wanted to keep reminding people that these are two guys with beating hearts who are in search of obsessively in search of some. Mm -hmm. Well, that that opened it up to me. It wasn't a documentary anymore. It was a movie about two guys uh, going after the president. Uh, and it took a while to find it, but it was very surgical in the sense that it couldn't be a full-blown score. You wouldn't want big action movie score it was a lot of it was in internal i remember he'd spend hours in the in, in mixing room just to get the sound of the typewriters in the news mm. the newsroom mm. getting the exact all of it combined you know the sound design and the music mm. and the first the first um cue in that picture doesn't come in until 40 minutes mm. into the uh, uh movie because we were wondering where, where you could start the music and not have it sound like you're going to have a score. Right. Um, the first stylized camera shot, non-documentary style camera shot in the movie was when they're sitting in the Library of Congress doing some research at one of those big tables and the camera starts close up on the table and then moves up to see the two guys sitting at the table going through whatever books they're going through. And because that was stylized, it, you could sneak music in under it. And that's wow. where that that beat started. Oh, um, my God. Wow. So again, it was an obsessive kind of theme. Uh, it, it was layered. It had that but it had a beat under it. Right. It's and contemporary. It, They're contemporary and, boys. Yeah. And then it had a melody uh, above that. Right. Uh, but there was no, like like many movies, you hear the big theme at the beginning of the picture and then sure. you hear fra fragments of it right. down the line. Right. Uh, this was the reverse of that. I would take different elements. I knew what I composed the whole theme, which you finally hear in its full glory or whatever. At the end, at the end, end. At yeah. the end I, <laughs> I could take elements of it and uh, create the mood I wanted, just right. rhythmically, and have that quality of forward motion and time running out. Right. to get this thing done, the right. clock ticking. Right. So that, that's an, uh, another example of a director really in, in a sentence or two breaking the thing open for me because mm. I would have walked away from that picture. Mm. I understand. I totally understand. You know, I'm fascinated with pictures like uh, Executive Suite yeah. or, or Hitchcock's Rear Window who, you know, and basically these Executive Suite has no music in it. And, yeah. and the music, it, it takes place in New York City and uh, and and, and it mostly in a in a in a suite of offices in, in a in a uh, business building, an office building, and the music, are the honks of the horns outside, and yeah. and stuff like that. That's it. And they didn't want well, any music. Sorry. That, that's a smart director, uh, in terms of music, because sometimes the best score is no is no score, just right. a, a, yeah. a 
a sound design. Um, sound design, that's a beautiful way of saying it. Yeah, so, so there's brilliant sound designers, for instance, on, uh, on uh, Fincher's Zodiac, which was the last big feature I, I scored. There was a sound designer called Ren Kleiss who did mm -hmm. all, done all of his movies. Uh, and I worked very closely with him. And on the conversation, Walter Murch, the sound designer, we worked very closely. I would send up cassettes of the themes I was writing on the piano or the cues. And he could, as the movie was being edited, he could f test them against various scenes. Yes. And often, often he would take something that... I had written specifically for one thing, one scene, and move it to another where it worked better. Oh, fantastic. you know, so it was a perfect, perfect blend of sound. You know that scene where the toilet overflows. In, the, in which the, picture the, Zodiac are you talking about? The, the conversation. Oh, the the bloody, concert, pardon me. The, yeah, yeah. The, sure the bloody did. toilet overflowing. Yes, yes. yes. There's, there's a piano music, but it's through a synthesizer, so it has remodulation sounds uh -huh. kind of. Bong, 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 bong. But there's also the sound of the toilet overflowing, and there's a mm. screech that he put in. So it's all together, uh, all together yeah. makes a makes a. It's a very casual. very co collaborative art. You have mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. you know, know what the goal is. And people people often ask me what the difference is between writing for the theater and writing for film. Yeah. In film, you are writing music to help someone else fulfill their vision. Right. The movie exists. They, and like a set designer, you're like a set designer or a mm -hmm. costume designer. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just another element in this collaborative enterprise called a, a, a motion picture. Right. Uh, whereas in the theater, Richard and I have decided what the subject matter is and it's our vision it's yeah. we're telling the story right. and i'm hiring other he's hiring other people to work work for us yeah so you're it. it's you're it. but but it's the same dramatic instinct that i learned in the theater right that has served me well in movies and it's the orchestrational and technical skills that I greatly improved having to write the kind of music I write for I uh, motion pictures, okay. which has made my made the execution of some of my theater music more uh, more knowing, giving me a wider wider toolbox, a oh, longer tool belt. You know. I can see that so they've they've crossed influenced each other, even though I've had kind of a schizophrenic, a bipolar career of one thing or the other, it, it it looks maybe good on the resume you're talking about, but I've, I've run into, I, I've had to give up movies sometimes because I was working on a, a theater score yeah. and, and vice versa. Yeah. And uh, people in Hollywood would say, what? why are you working in the theater? That's a, a dinosaur medium. Uh, in, in those early days, it was in the 70s and 80s, it was a period when the theater was getting less and less relevant. Sure. And Steve Sondheim once said to me, why are you wasting so much time writing movies? Uh, you should be writing one musical after another. And so in a way, each career has, has diluted the other one, but they, at the same time, they've cross-pollinated. I can see that. I can see that as a as a musician. I can see that utterly. And yeah. the thing, the I want to talk about the third aspect. You got movies and uh, theater, and now here's this other thing which has come out of your movies mostly, is your songwriting ability. And you're a great songwriter, and exactly. and uh, you know people have recognized you for that. Uh, obviously, you know with awards and such. But I mean, from songwriter to songwriter, you're yeah. great. And and there are things. One of that, the best songs I wrote, I wrote with you. Well, <laughs> well thank in you. In our hands. In our hands. It's a beautiful song. And can I tell you a story about that? So we wrote yeah. uh, David and I wrote in our hands uh, for the uh, world, the United Nations World Summit for Children. Yeah. And uh, we performed it in the United Nations. Well, children's choirs all around the world sang it, didn't they? Well, as the time, true. as as the time zone changed. That's true. That's true. No. But here's but here's the here's the story, and you're going to like this. 
So, uh, so we, we did it in the General Assembly Hall, and it was really awesome. I sang, you play, we had all these, these kids sing. Well, cut to, oh, several years ago, I'm, doing, I'm involved in some kind of a, a tribute to Joseph Stein. And uh, who is there but Lynn manuel Miranda. And uh, he's, you know, he just hasn't quite, he hasn't uh, done Hamilton quite yet. This is a few years ago. Yeah. Anyway, he's, but, he's he, but he did. In the Heights. He's done. He did In the Heights and he was already yeah. on the map. But anyway, here it is. So I'm standing there and he comes up to me and he says, David Pomerantz? I said, yeah. He says, I was in the children's choir at the United Nations with you and David Shire. And I love the song you guys wrote. Oh, <laughs> he was 10 or something like that. nine or 10 years old. Yeah, Isn't that you awesome? Never, you never know who you're influencing and who your music is going. You've experienced this. I'm, I'm sure the wonderful thing of somebody you don't know sure. doesn't have to be a celebrity like no. Lynn Manuel or, or Sandham. But you, you must have gotten fan mail for it. this yeah, song yeah. changed my life, sure. or I did this song at my wedding, and of I course. always remember it. I'm sure you you get that. Yeah. Listen, you you get a lot of that, I'm sure, because here are the song, some of these songs. I got to talk about this because these are some of my favorite songs in life, um, and one uh, one is from Norma Ray, which you won the Oscar, uh, yeah. for which you won the Oscar, uh, with Norman Gimbel writing lyrics. And um, that song, if you don't know it, everybody, just to remind you. So it goes like it goes, like the river flows, and time keeps, time it rolls right on. And maybe what's good gets a little bit better, and maybe what's bad gets gone. And you play this ragtimey harmony thing and yeah, i just yeah, sob yeah. like a baby and you know what everybody does there's a story about the, the birth of that song yes go ahead tell me tell us we had to write a title song for norma ray and they had already earmarked johnny cash to Don oh no i'm sorry not johnny waylon jennings remember okay. him sure waylon jennings to sing uh the song so Norman Gimbel and I wrote a song that had about five notes <laughs> range and uh, totally undistinguished. And um, then Jennings came in and saw the picture and decided he didn't want to do it. Uh, Norman and I thought, mm -hmm. well, maybe because he realized it was anti, it was pro-union and he was a Southern whatever yes. that, that might have but for some reason he, he chose not to do it huh? so we had a week to um to write another song oh and uh we looked i remember we looked with uh, uh marty with the producer at the uh, director at the charts to see who was charting right at that point jennifer warren said it was on the chart somewhere yeah and uh so then we had to write a song for Jennifer Warren, which is a whole different thing. Yeah. The song for Waylon Jennings, besides being musically not very, very good, would, would have been like the ballad of Norma Ray, you know, mm. Norma Ray. Da, 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 da. Commenting on what's going on there. Yeah. yeah. But for, for Jennifer Warren's, the, the approach was to write a, a song which was. Uh, uh, Nor Norma Ray's statement, mm -hmm. as if she was singing mm -hmm. the song, mm -hmm. which right away makes for a more in interesting song, and certainly one that uh, a lot of possibilities. And she has a range of a cu couple of octaves, but that song very easily could have not not been written. Ah, well, thank God it was. It's a beautiful thing, and uh, and Norman's Norman Gimbel's lyric is. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it really quickly because it's it's that good. Uh, Ain't no miracle being born, people doing it every day. Ain't no miracle growing old, people just roll that way. Isn't that cool? So it goes like it goes, and the river flows, and time it rolls right on. And maybe what's good gets a little bit better, 
<laughs> I can't stand it. It's so great. And maybe what's bad gets gone. Oh, yeah. come on. <laughs> oh, well, gosh. And well, did he no, just, did he hand, go ahead, what? No, what did you say? No, did, did he hand that to you or did you, did you make the lyric, the, the music first mm -hmm. or how did that happen? I know it's a pedantic question, but. He was, he was so pissed off that we had to write another song and they won't. <laughs> They weren't going to pay him for another oh, lyric. Oh. lyric. But you see, I was hired to do the whole picture. So oh, right. the, it was a part of my fee for doing the whole score. So I didn't have to worry about getting another. I didn't expect anything extra. It was just to throw away a cue. You got to write another cue. Right. Uh, but he was furious. Oh, my. And we didn't talk to each other. Oh, he... He, he wrote that lyric exactly as it stands, word for word, had a messenger deliver it to my house with the note saying, don't change a syllable of this. I'm going away on a, a ski trip. Don't call me. And I sat down at the piano and, and not very long, the song came rather easily. And oh. I don't consider myself uh, a great setter of other people's lyrics. I've done a lot of lyrics of my own that I've, that I, I you know, the setting comes with, the, the lyric comes with the music. Right. But um, that one just happened to be a, a lucky strike. And it went like it went, like the river goes. <laughs> yeah. Right, it flows. Well, and yeah. and the, the next time we talked to each other, literally, was a year and a half later when we were sitting next to each other at the Oscars. <laughs> and the Berkmans, I was also nominated for another. Yes, you were. That's my next comment. Go ahead. Yeah. And they were sitting next to us. And Norman was very cold. And I wasn't about to start the conversation. And. We won, and you know, they usher you off the stage mm -hmm. and into an elevator. And in that elevator, as we were going up to the press, Norman said to me, well, I guess we're going to have to talk to each other now. Okay. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And you must have talked to each other since then. Well, anyway. Yes, yes, we did. Good. We even tried to maybe write something else together, but we never Good. did. All right. Well, the next the next song I want to take up is the one you just mentioned, uh, is I'll Never Say Goodbye. It's from the movie The Promise, and David uh, Shire wrote this with the Bergmans. We, we, I, I interviewed uh, Alan Bergman uh, yeah. in the beginning, and I've interviewed uh, Millis Manchester, who sang, hmm. who sang this gorgeous record oh, of your yeah. song. Isn't, it, isn't it gorgeous? And I always, I always wanted a Melissa Manchester record. Mm. Well, you got, <laughs> we were, you got a great rendition. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I even approached her to we tried to write some songs together, but it okay. just never, it never happened. So I was okay. just thrilled that it yeah. was her. Well, it's beautiful, and uh, so the, the, uh, the, the melodic. Uh, scheme that you wrote that just just well the melody let's not get too technical here the melody that you wrote is bitchin dude <laughs> Thank, <laughs> and, and listen thanks, thanks man <laughs> say goodbye why i can barely say good night if i can hardly take my eyes from yours how far can i go walk away the thought would never cross my mind i couldn't turn my back on spring or fall your smile least of all when i say always i mean forever I trust tomorrow as much as today. I'm not afraid okay to say I love you. you. And I promise you I'll never say goodbye. And here's the thing about that song. You've got three hooks in there. Three. Uh, you know, you, right? Yeah. Okay, well, I'd settle for one. 
two. Oh. You got three. That's gorgeous, man. Gorgeous work. Thank you. You bet. You. you bet. My God. By the way, I I thought I was a sure loser from that Academy Award because not only would my friends vote for one song or the other and dilute my total, right? But Marvin Hamlish was up for Ice Castle, right? And Kermit the Frog sang, uh, uh, "Oh, rainbows, um, rainbow, rainbow connection. connection." I thought no one beats either Marvin Hamlish or Kermit the Frog, but right. I just happened to think maybe those two diluted their well, <laughs> their good. votes more than it mine could, got diluted. It could have, but yes, it could well have, and because they, they both have emotional impact. Sorry, you did do that. That was that was. You know the terrible. the general the general theme of a lot of this conversation is, and I'm quite serious about this, is that so much of this business, as you know, is luck, and and uh, uh, concatenation of, of events that lead into something that you never thought you were going to do, or things you try to get you don't get. And suddenly, out of the blue, some through some other contact, you get something else. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that more and more. I believe that um, any talent or skill is first det uh, semi determined when sperm meets egg, mm -hmm. and the genetic your genetic makeup is determined, mm -hmm. which isn't going to change. And then the nurture part takes place as you grow up. Mm -hmm. But it's really a chain of events that leads to other chain of events. And I, I'm sure, I've said this a number of times, that if my father had been a, a, an insurance salesman or a plumber, I would have wound up being a plumber or insurance salesman. And I, I thought that what he did was, was the greatest thing. Uh, I didn't know what a lot of other people did, but... You know, and yet it could work the other way. Leonard Bernstein's family had no, nothing to do with music. Sure, of course. Yeah. Well, if you'd been a plumber, you'd be singing tunes in your head and going, "Stop it!" <laughs> not necessarily. Not necessarily. I could have been an English teacher uh, who was a frustrated composer. Okay, that, that could have taken place if and I hadn't met, if I hadn't met Maltby at Yale. You know. I, what what is the ch the chances of two songwriters meeting that way yeah. and having a sixty three year old and still counting career? That's so I, it's true. just incredible. Yeah, it is incredible, and and you guys sound like one voice when yeah. you write your songs and yeah. you write your plays. Should should we jump? Are you doing okay with time? Are you all right? Just a little. Oh bit yeah. Time? Great, I'm, I can, I'm having so much fun. Thank you. Uh, time goes so quickly when you're talking about yourself. Uh, or when you're talking about what you love, like yourself. Okay. No, yeah. <laughs> when you talk about what you love. Okay. Uh, no, this, you, is, this is a lot of fun. Good, I'm glad, David. Thank you. Um, so uh, anyway, all the, the, there's more songs. Before we go to the, the theater thing. Oh, you can't forget... Well, that's what I'm going to talk about. So this is so, so this is a song from a, a, a movie which is, you know, fairly well uh, accepted. Not, sure. not a big it's, hit. It's, it's fairly Cassidy. well on. It's fairly well unknown. <laughs> they, yes, it, it was very successful at, at being hidden, uh, but it's yeah. called Fast Break. Is that what it was? Yeah. And so you wrote this tune with Carol Connors. Is that right? Yeah. Well, again, it's, just, it's such a strange evolution of that song being written and becoming a hit. Motown was the producer of the movie. Uh -huh. And um, that yes. melody was written as a love, a love theme for one cue, which was a throwaway cue that I wrote when I was separated from, from Talia. Uh, on, on, on the way to a divorce, living in a, one of those, you know, places for people in that limbo between <laughs> marriages. Motown wanted to put out a, an album of this, of a record of the movie for promotion. And we had written a title song called Go For It, a disco song. Go for it, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
And that was the A side of the record. And they needed a B side. So uh, the brains at Motown, I think it was Susan DePass at that, at that point, said, take, so, take something else, another theme in the movie, and, and, and Carol do a lyric for it. So we took, we took that melody, Carol wrote a lyric for it, and it went on the B side. And they released the record, and it did nothing. And then one day, a, a disc, big disc jockey in Chicago called Suzanne or somebody else at Motown and said, you know, you, you, you got the sides reversed. If you put with you on Born Again as the, B, as the A side, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get on it. And he got on it, and it went to number four, I think, here, and two in uh, Great Britain and was oh. on the charts for 26 weeks. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. 26 weeks. But then again, there was another another musician. I can't remember who it was who referred to the song as With You On Board Again. Oh, boo, <laughs> sis. Well, you and, got, Billy, you got, and Billy Preston in an interview said when they asked asked him about it because it was one of the biggest hits he ever had. He's a, yeah, it was first class songwriter. Yeah. And I think he was kind of annoyed because he says, yeah, it's one of those white bread things. Uh, he, he, that's what he said about it, was one of those white bread things? Yeah. yeah. Well, so, go show me your sweetness. Na, da, 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 da. Well, it was very unusual to hear that on the radio, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was for me. I'm asking yeah. you. It was for me. I thought, wow, that's no, a song you don't, you don't hear. Yeah. It was great. And it's so. Uh, your it, arms, I'm born again. Major chord. La da da di di no na na, I'm born again. It goes into the sweet waltz thing. Oh, it's a beautiful record in a beautiful and, song. Mm -hmm. And it's a waltz and it's in a minor key. And who would expect that no. to be a hit? And. The thing is, Richard and I, in our early days, we were so intent about having a hit. We got to have a hit. Yeah. Uh, and we would take songs, we would write songs. One of them was called Lover's Mountain. <laughs> take my hand and soon we be on Lover's Mountain. <laughs> you know, we write bad songs. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get a hit. And we wrote a, Johnny Ma a song for Johnny Mathis that was supposed to, it never got anywhere let, let that be a lesson to you songwriters no but whenever we took these records these so melodies or these yeah. songs to uh uh the, the uh uh a and r men yeah at the re record companies yeah they invariably said gee that's a lovely song but that's a theater song right sure. that's a theater song it's it's not a hit song right. and we'd be so disappointed but we learned finally that it's that's what our normal impulse is. We write, but you, we write but, theater. So, so the hit one hit song I had, real big hit, was accidental because well, sure. it came out. But it always, but it always is. I don't know. I've never written anything that had any traction that was something. You know what? That's not true. I did write. I well, wrote a, you had a song a I didn't care for that was a big hit. I, oh, sorry. I always envied you because you had that direct line to Barry Manilow. <laughs> yes, well, and I, I just imagine anything you wrote, you call up, say, "Hey, Barry, I'm no. sending over you my latest," and no. he, he recorded. We I took songs to Barry Bandelow, and he never sang any of them. Okay, well, he'd have been good yeah. on uh, on uh, with you on Born Again. That'd have been nice. But Billy yeah. Billy Preston was perfect, and, and you know, and when the note goes, just really quickly, I'll we we'll get into the next thing. But when it, when the note goes really low, because it's in the girl's key, really, so it's got to be yeah. in his key too. So, know me your broadness, uh, Billy Preston, da 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 I'm born again. And he's right at the very bottom of his key. And he pulls it off because it's got, it's got, it's got schminglich. It's schminglich. It's got schminglich. I don't know what that means, but I think it's hard. I think I'm pounding my, my microphone, but you know, but that's why, I think. Um. And then, uh, and then before we leave uh, the land of, of movies, uh, well, come on, you, you scored Saturday Night Fever, for yeah. God's sake. Well, and, you know. The, the, and that's how you got this house, the B, for God's the B, sake. The Bee Gees scored, no, it's our previous house I got, though. Oh, pardon But, but it, 
It isn't that simple because when Talia and I, by the way, we're still very close friends and we Good. have a wonderful son and uh, we've stayed very close. Saturday Night Fever, in which I almost turned down because it was an adaptation job. Right. Oh, right. J- John Batter was an old college friend of mine, the director. Oh, wow. And he was at Universal starting out when I was starting out right. in, in film, television music. Right. And I had scored a few movies in a week for him, and we had a very good collaboration. So he came to me one day and said, would you like to... Um, I, doing this picture called uh, Saturday Night Fever, and it's got a lot of songs by the Bee Gees, but it, it needs some connective score and everything. Would you do an adaptation? And I, my first impulse was to say, well, no, I don't do adaptations. I was pretty full of myself as a, a film composer. Sure. And I, wanted to, I wanted to write the songs. Not right, somebody but the else. adaptation but, means means that you would you would, you would would underscore using the, the melodies of the Bee Gees. Yeah. That, yeah, okay. But, so I told John, saw that I was reluctant. He says, if you do the picture, uh, there are going to be a number of disco songs, existing disco songs that we use for the, to fill out the album. Right. And uh, I'll make sure that three, of you, three disco songs of, that we need for scenes, you will write and they will be on the record. So I yeah. said, okay, but nobody had any idea what that movie was going to be. Wow. Nobody. Because oh. uh, Greece, that my dear wife of 38 years, Dee Dee Khan, uh, was in, uh, was hadn't come out yet. So Travolta was known as a television actor, but he didn't have any uh, uh, visibility as a singing, dancing all-star. Hmm. Uh, actor, the synergy took place, and right. uh, because of the Bee Gees mainly, the yeah, score went through the roof. The album was the largest selling album at that to, to date at that time, mm-hmm. went double platinum or something. Yeah, uh, but when Talia and I got divorced, uh, she had done Rocky One, for which she got five figures because nobody thought that movie was going to be anything. It was oh. another. And I turned it down, by the way, because oh I, had, I had another big movie that I was doing called The Big Bus, which I was, was a big score and a, a, a disaster movie parody. I thought, well, that's sure fire. And what's this, a boxing movie? It goes, uh, been a million of those. And it, that's the great <laughs> one of the, the great, Sadnesses of my life. Was, oh, was they really didn't good. do Rocky. But anyway, okay. all right. She she did Rocky one and they <laughs> really got divorced. Saturday, Rocky two, for which she got uh, seven figures, <laughs> was not in the community property. It just missed. Oh, but but Saturday Night Fever was. So oh. she she got half of Saturday Night Fever and I got half of Rocky one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it still it still was good. It was a good. I'm not complaining. Yeah, that's was, good for both of you. That's all right. Was, I'm not Ca- complaining. California, the great California. Okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna move uh, to uh, the subject of of theater. And um, and before we we do, I want to say uh, just a, a little compliment for you. There's a, there's a, a movie you did only when I laugh. Um, yeah. With uh, Neil Simon. Uh, I, I listen, guys. Go go to Wikipedia. Because that's where you go, or David's website, David David Music dot com. Music dot com, and all look one at word. all yeah, and look at all of the 157 amazing things. So many classic films and brilliant scores. But this one, uh, only when I laugh, I'm bringing it up because the the score is terrific. Um, but the song, I can't stop singing it in my mind. I can't. I love that I li- song. It's such a great song. And uh, it goes, uh, and and here's a. This is a Malpe lyric, and uh, oh so yeah, here, it's a w- wonderful lyric. Wonderful. So lyric. so uh, anyway, I, I'm gonna read the, the end of this lyric uh, because yeah. I, I just played this for my mom last night. My mom is with us, and and she's she is a big fan, and and I said, listen to this lyric, mom, and um, she, anyway, it's, it's it's an irony song. So the la- the last verse is every time I fell in love, I never felt completely. The joke is I was saving something for the person that I thought was you. Well, well, I guess I was dreaming, glad the fantasy's dead and gone. 
And if my mind keeps running back and forth and back and forth, don't take that as a clue. Here's the lyric. It was a minor operation I pulled through, opened up my life, and took out you. <laughs> my only scars, a heart that's neatly torn in half. Does it really hurt me? Only when I laugh. Yeah, it's just... Ah! <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. And David's David's music, da, ba, da, 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 boo, bee, bum. It's so jaunty and lovely, and and I cannot get out of my head. Damn. And it. I can't. I, I'm really disappointed. No one's ever covered it or sung it in a nightclub act or anything. It's oh, uh, crazy. We've had a lot of obscure songs that have never been hits, but are big cabaret circuit. Sure. Uh, but that's a, but it's a great song. That's I don't care who who sings no, it. He's, he is such a good lyricist. And we, they, we yeah. by the way, I, I am uh, uh, defiantly unretired, and we have a new show that would have gone in, into production uh, a year ago, except for the pandemic. But finally, we're able to do a workshop of it on Zoom starting Monday morning. We're going to have a week-long Zoom with a cast of 13. Oh, wow. uh, for the first time, we're going to hear our new, our new show. 